My name is uh, Omolade uh, Salu. Uh, I'm a lead uh, data scientist uh, with IBM. Uh, I'm a senior uh, manager leading like a team of uh, data scientists and uh, helping uh, our client to solve or tackle uh, challenging problems. Uh, right now, we're focused uh, on a lot of like interesting problems uh, in natural resources. However, uh, Pavel uh, leads uh, uh, my team, uh, meaning uh, we're not just uh, exclusively like focusing on uh, natural resources. We have like financial services, utilities, healthcare, whatever. I mean, you name it. Uh, we're in consulting, so wherever the problem is, we have the team to execute. However, for the local I mean, team, we've had uh, a lot of focus uh, on natural resources. So what Cole and I will be talking about I mean, today uh, will be uh, of interest to uh, a lot of people here because uh, we're in that part of the country where natural resources is important. Before I get into it or introduce the problem, a little bit about myself. Um, I had uh, my bachelor's in uh, math and computer science and uh, started my career uh, as a programmer uh, before eventually uh, proceeding for my master's and PhD uh, in computer science, uh, focusing on uh, application of advanced analytics and uh, machine learning to solving um, uh, uh, software engineering uh, problems. Uh, part of my uh, first I mean, journey uh, in this uh, particular uh, area was uh, building uh, a neural fuzzy uh, cost estimator uh, for software uh, development and for prediction. And from that, uh, it has I mean, actually uh, continued uh, till date. In the past uh, 11 years, I've been in consulting, and I only joined IBM about six years ago. And most of my projects, like I'll say, uh, they have natural resources, including like midstream uh, pipeline, I mean, scheduling optimization, failure prediction, uh, subsurface, I mean, production optimization. Anywhere uh, we have like uh, the client interested in solving challenging problem in this space, we bring that. And again, uh, what really helps us is we have uh, a natural resource solution center where we have like team of um, uh, domain I mean, experts that help us in understanding this space. Now, moving to um, this uh, very recent work, uh, which uh, uh, I'm leading uh, from uh, IBM. Uh, the title, again, it says Application of Machine Learning uh, to uh, All Body uh, uh, Discovery. Um, just a little bit about uh, All Body. I'm sure maybe a few of us will be familiar with what all is. Precious uh, minerals I mean, present uh, in economically I mean, viable uh, uh, position I mean, to be extracted. It could be like gold, it could be zinc, it could be anything. Uh, for the presentation we're having today, you may kind of hear us talking more about like gold mining because this is just like an application of it. So uh, the very first thing that I would like to talk about is why bother at all? Why is this a problem? Uh, we know like gold prices have been going up, uh, I mean for a while, but again, there are a lot of like uh, stories around uh, the decline in the amount of um, uh, our body or gold I mean, content extracted. For example, there was an interview that the chairman of I mean, Gold Corp I mean, granted to Financial Post, and part of what I mean, he said in that interview was he, he actually believed they are the peak of gold. So he sees like decline from this position uh, going forward. Part of the questions that came in that interview is, are they not just like looking, at, uh, looking for it the right way, or have they exhausted their own traditional way of approaching this? So it brings into like, I mean, question uh, the fact that are there ways that machine learning or advances in data science can help them augment the way they do things today and make them more efficient? Part of it, again, is cost. Like, um, you can always say, OK, maybe there's I mean, a precious metal here. There's gold there. If we all know, we probably won't be sitting here. But there are other things that geologists and all their mining engineers go through to determine if there is presence of those like precious metal or mineral in a particular I mean, location. So our goal is you need, um, if there is no cost associated with your drilling, then you can just drill everywhere. I can just keep drilling until I hit, I mean, I'm lucky one day and I hit gold. However, the cost of drilling will always like, uh, factor into whatever decision that you make. So again, our goal is to look at this in uh, entirety to say, can you get economically viable 
like gold production, I mean, for example, or, your, or I mean, uh, uh, that you're targeting uh, at a minimal cost. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but before we start talking about like uh, modeling, I know uh, I mean uh, work with a lot of I mean data scientists, both like I mean within and outside I mean IBM, and we have a lot of conversation going in. Everybody just want to deep dive, start building model. You can start I mean building model, but you're building model on what? So the number one thing. Uh, apart from asking about, okay, building your model, uh, thinking about, okay, how is the end user, the business, going to use your model to make a decision? Like, most of those questions, sometimes we jump at the problem without even, like, looking at uh, what the outcome is going to be. So what we did was to, like, step back to say, we have a goal. But before you even get into the process of developing, like, any model, what data are you going to build your model on? There are a lot of data that uh, the I mean, clients and all these uh, I mean, operators uh, in this space I mean, collect. For example, they take their core samples. They drill, pull out the rock, take a sample, take it to the lab. They can uh, visually inspect to say, oh, I can see uh, the content, uh, I mean, the rock type here. I can see uh, the pattern of vein or the structure, and they will record it. That's part of their knowledge they've learned in school. They know how to identify these things. They take it to the lab to kind of uh, quantify the amount of uh, mineral they have in that particular, I mean, uh, core sample that they took. That's one data source. Another one is they go into their mind, for example, go through the drift, and you have, like, I mean, uh, geologists and miners taking samples, just taking rock chip, and from that, they take these samples as well, and they try to, like, uh, analyze the type of rock or pattern they're seeing, and what resulted in the formation historically to get this particular mineral deposited. That's another I mean, source of data. Some of them just go into the drift and they manually look uh, up at the drift and they uh, hand uh, draw their maps to say, okay, I'm drawing a map of what I'm seeing in this particular drift part of the mine. So all of these are really, really like, I mean, good like, I mean, data sources, but how do you put all of this together? So what we did was to step back to say, before we start talking about building a model, we're going to build a platform that will support um, I mean, geologists in uh, making like, I mean, at least good decision based on what, instead of spending time looking for data in different systems and looking for uh, at archives of I mean, documents, build uh, a platform that will allow you to uh, have like a one-stop shop for all those, I mean, to get those questions answered. I won't get into the I mean, depth of I mean, this particular platform. Uh, it's a platform they are currently I mean, using, and it has enabled them uh, to I mean, do a lot of basic query faster. On top of this, though, um, if, when uh, they do their modeling uh, and they take maybe their I mean, core sample, part of the work they do is to say, uh, we're going to uh, build uh, a subsurface model like a geological model, I mean, structure. I mean, look at that as uh, maybe, I mean, collection of uh, tetrahedron or polyhedron, just a shape object. And it describes the geometry you have in the subsurface. You can say, uh, for this I mean, uh, part, I have maybe gold here. Uh, in the other part, I have, like, I mean, basalt, which is uh, another, I mean, type of rock. So they build those structures. And some of the questions they want to answer is, if I drill here, what is the chance that uh, the I mean, hole that I'm drilling is hitting a particular I mean, type of rock or a, a particular type of mineral? Those basic queries, they look, I mean, they sound simple, but they're really, really complex and difficult. Why? Because if you uh, look at a 3D geometry representation, uh, take this mic as an example. If I want to find if this mic, I have a structure, if it intersects uh, that particular structure, the problem is, Traditionally or currently, the current state, uh, I mean, in the uh, industry, or um, uh, the current state of, I mean, doing such comparison, is to take every point here and compare it to every point of your structure. That's really, really expensive, and it runs forever. So what we build is uh, uh, a custom uh, algorithm that, um, that will run part of those complex query on cluster of GPUs. Again, you can say this is not, it doesn't require any training. What it does is the platform takes your query as a user 
and it will automatically detect the part of it that is just a basic query. Like, I mean, maybe rock structure, or I just want to query the existence of drill hole somewhere, it will return that fast. The difficult part, the algorithm is going to separate it and send that to the GPU cluster and returns the result back for those complex geometry intersection, aggregate it with your result, and present it in real time. So one major thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, about the platform. Again, the platform is mostly an enabler for us to say, we have I mean, somewhere where we can source all of our data I mean, uh, from, like I mean, your, your drill, your block, your maps, and I mean, other document. Now we can think about building models. So coming back to the actual I mean, uh, problem uh, we're trying to uh, address, I've talked about why should we even bother? We know why it's important. The next question is, what did we do about it? So here, what we did was to take, like you see uh, in the uh, upper corner there, these are I mean, rock samples they took from the drill hole, and they partitioned them into like intervals so that they can measure like a different characterization of those interval and what I mean the properties of those like I mean like I say your mineral your uh, I mean your rock type your structure what what, what have you what you see here again it's uh, a hand drawn map that's what they have somebody went in there and said okay I'm right here I can see like a contact I can see like a deep I can see a particular structure uh, there and they just manually write it. So part of what Amicole is going to be talking about is how we took information from this, interpret the handwritten map, and combine them with other data sources, like I mean, your drill data, I mean, your chip that I talked about, and all those data to be able to like, build a model that can answer the question we want to answer about targeting like drill. Where do we drill next? That's essentially the question they want to answer. So we take, I mean, this, I mean, data, and we build, um, uh, I mean, modeling, I mean, approach that will be able to like represent structurally represent this information in a way that you can learn from what they have collected. So you have, I mean, representation like take this, I mean, uh, a room as a uh, uh, as a space in your subsurface. I want to characterize this, model it, and see if I can build a model that would train. Uh, 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 the, uh, the model that can be trained in such a way that if I see a pattern similar to this particular room in the future, I can tell you what concentration or class or level of gold mineralization, for example. Again, like I said, it applies to any other use case in this particular space. And the whole idea is we want geologists to still be geologists. We want miners to still be miners. Just like we I mean, support like production engineers to still be production engineers, but we want to enhance what, what they do. Like, I mean, supercharge them, empower them to be able to like, make informed decision. Instead of just blindly, like, I mean, drilling, like, uh, well, not, I mean, blindly, based on, like, I mean, maybe first principle modeling, say, okay, we'll drill here, drill here, take samples. How can you reduce the number of drilling that you, make, uh, th that you do to be able to like, make decision? about where to target for drilling and uh, hopefully uh, get results. So um, I would actually I mean, pass it to Cole, uh, again, uh, part of the team that work uh, on this uh, particular engagement to take us through the how. Hey guys, so uh, my name is Cole McLean, so I'm part of Omalati's team. And this project has been the bulk of my work uh, here in IBM. Uh, I am part of the technical team, so I apologize if my nerves are showing through. Uh, but I'm really stoked to have the opportunity to share the work that I've been doing here. Thanks, guys. That helps. That helps a lot. Uh, so this is a, a really busy slide. It's actually capturing the entire pipeline the team's in here for the predictive modeling portion of the platform that Omalati introduced. Uh, so the four main steps, uh, we have to digitize, identify, and analyze the different data sets that are available to us solve problem. We have to encode that in a way that machines can understand and uh, predictive modeling algorithms can learn from. We have to apply those different algorithms, and then we have to evaluate how well we're actually performing. So the first part, digitize, is probably the bulk of the effort that's been going on in this project. Taking structured data, so drill hole core data where engineers and geologists have drilled into the ground, 
taken up and dug up rock, looked at the rock, interpreted it, and then entered that into a tabulated format. That combined with unstructured data, the hand-drawn and digital maps to actually go under the ground, look at rocks, and draw different structures and identify different markings on a piece of paper, how do we use that in a machine learning model? So the first step of this pipeline is uh, object detection algorithm on these hand-drawn maps. So we're using fast CNNs, which is sort of inspired by uh, face detection algorithms where you're cascading across the map to identify these structures and then pull off uh, the actual markings that are on these maps. And we're seeing some pretty amazing results from that. Once we do that, then we can combine these markings under the ground that we have in an XYZ space with this drill hole core data that we've also assigned an XYZ space in a three-dimensional cube. Uh, and then we can combine them into a point cloud representation. So each point in this point cloud has assigned all the geo variables that are available to us in the mine. So that's great, but then this point cloud has a combination of categorical features, continuous variables, interpreted variables, stuff that came from maps. We have to be smart about how we encode that information. So we've been exploring many different techniques on how we encode categorical variables, how we combine them with continuous variables. The one that we found the most success with is our learned embedding. So we're taking the categorical geological structure information and we're passing it into a feed-forward neural network to learn a lower dimensional embedding space that is capable of understanding this type of rock is very similar to that type of rock. And this type of mineralization is very similar to that type of mineralization. And once we're able to do that, then we can use that similarity measure in a uh, numeric format. So it, it spits out an actual vector of, of numbers that tell you that this rock is similar to that rock. Then we can use that to feed into our predictive models. Uh, so that's one type of encoding that we had to do. The other type of encoding is how do we encode the structure of this information? So I mentioned the point cloud representation where we just have points in three dimensional space. And a lot of machine learning models can consume that type of representation. But the advances in image recognition and de detection uh, using convolutional neural networks expect a, a structured grid representation. So we had to put a lot of effort into transforming that 3D cloud into a structured grid formation, which is the cuboid that you're seeing uh, at the bottom of the screen there. And then how do we actually interpolate and grab and fill these voxels, these three-dimensional. So a lot of work and, and thought and design went into building the actual structure of the data set before actually applying any type of modeling to make predictions. Once we had that foundation, then we were able to apply the scientific method where we explored many different types of modeling techniques, not just the sexy deep learning techniques, but also the more traditional methods. Uh, so we ran models uh, for all of those. Our, our back ends were sklearn and TensorFlow for the deeper ones. So we are finding better success in the convolutional neural, which makes a lot of sense to us because if you think about it, the spatial context of a geological structure should be really important predicting mineralization. Um, so that, that, that is in fact the case, but we wanted to be sure to prove that out uh, and explore both. Do you have a question? If you're taking questions, uh, sure. Pooling yeah, there is pooling layers, yeah. So you don't believe that pooling eliminates the spatial? It'll summarize it, right? It'll summarize the, the spatial awareness in the localized regions. But So we do have multiple architectures. Some don't have pooling. One, the one that's currently the most successful, so this is an ongoing project, uh, does have one pooling layer. So, and that's just summarizing in a local region the information from there, right? But you still capture the local spa spatial information in, in the region. Sure, if anyone else has questions, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm glad that I'm that laid back that you can just have questions. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and then the, the final thing that you have to be sure to do is properly evaluate how these models are actually operating and how you, your different decisions along the entire pipeline 
are, are affecting the performance. So defining this evaluation is super important. So we've done this in three different ways. We've done it technically with a technical metric. We've done it in an economic context, defining a, a business value from actually drilling the drill holes we tell you to. And then in a more qualitative measure, using the geologist domain expert to visualize our results and they go, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense, or what are you crazy? There's no gold over there. Um, so the, and that feedback loop has been the most important part about this project. So we have weekly update meetings with the client. They visualize the predictions that we're making and they're going, wow, that's amazing. That's really cool that you're finding stuff there. And then they're also going, but why is it saying this over here? That makes no sense, look into that. We go like, oh yeah, that we, we can encode it differently. We can expand how far we're searching. What, whatever, all the tuning parameters that we have to us can improve these results dramatically, but only if we're engaging continually with the domain experts. Um, so that's, that's the full sort of approach. I will stop here for questions if anyone has questions on this particular slide. Back in the red. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I caught your first question, but so we don't cross-validate, but we do split into three different training sets, but we're very cautious about how we do that splitting. We split both spatially and then also by class. Uh, so this is a class classification problem. We're splitting into different grade cuts of gold, and then we are uh, being sure to sample those data sets so that the distribution of both class and spatially distributed are the same. The second question, over time, we have a frozen data set of drill holes um, that we just take a snapshot of and say that's our entire data set. It, it doesn't matter if we drilled them all yesterday or we just drilled them all over the last 80 years. That's how much information that we have available to us, and it's just a frozen data set. Uh, yeah, for now. Oh, sorry, the graph is SK Learn's recommended, recommended path of which models to use in which case. Oh. Yeah, sorry, that's uh, specific to a package. Um, so with the code in the description, if you have like multiple description over there, for instance, say it's like sandstone, sandstone, very fine, shady limestone. Yeah. How do you even bifurcate like whether it's like 100% uh, sandstone or 100% limestone? So or the, the so, so, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, how do you, do you want to actually, yeah. Sorry. So with the core data, there's a lot of description inside that. It says like sandstone, sandstone, very fine, shady limestone, let's say. Yeah. Right? So it's really hard to pinpoint whether it's a limestone or a sandstone. And if you identify that, how do you extrapolate it to anything that you want? Uh, yeah, so this is, we are taking in interpreted data from geologists. Geologists are actually pulling out this rock and they're going, there's this much sand sandstone over this interval, and it's not sand typically sandstone in this domain, but that's okay. Uh, and so they say literally how much there is in this depth, right? And so we can take this cube, but inside the cube we have exact measures of how much of each geo variable there, there were. I'll stop there for now so that I finish, but yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Yeah, yeah you guys can come find me. Uh, okay, so that's the approach, and like I said, this is an ongoing project, but we do have current findings. So as I mentioned, the deep models are performing traditional models. The margin isn't gigantic, but it is substantial enough to be like economically the right choice, uh, and it does make intuitive sense. Uh, so the different encodings that we're exploring, this learned embedding of, of learning the similarity between all these geo variables, not, not relying on just geo, geo, geologist in, intuition and not just performing PCA to find the, the dominant axes of variation. We, we need a similarity between these geo variables. And the, a big reason is that there's a lot of bias cooked into this data. 
uh, geologists actually interpret identical structures or, or rocks as different structures. And this learned embedding has provided us a tool for proving that out and showing that, hey, your geologists think these two rocks are really, really similar. And then the, the client's actually going, oh yeah, they mess that up all the time. It's, it's actually pretty cool. It's one of their favorite parts of the project. Um, we were learning this model. This model's learning on three different mines with three very different mineralization styles, and we're still able to make some pretty cool uh, predictions. So that generalizability is a, a pretty cool outcome. We're looking now into breaking the model into specific mineralization styles and to see how much better those perform. But right now it is uh, being quite successful on a general basis. Um, and yeah, so we're currently in that feedback loop where our results are being validated qualitatively by uh, the geologists. Uh, we're, the model's really, really good at predicting where there's not gold. Uh, we have a lot of examples for that, so that makes a lot of sense, but that's a, lot, a big cost savings, right? If we can tell you not to drill there, and that drilling there do doesn't get you any more information, then don't drill there. Uh, yeah. And then uh, it is identifying regions that the, the client is excited to explore further. Um, so challenges. This is actually the description of this talk, is that we were going to present unique challenges that we found in this project. I don't know if these are actually unique to this particular project or if they're just unique to data science projects in general. Um, and it was harder to come up with technical challenges than it was non-technical. Uh, and the hardest ones were in the middle. So this is, this is research. It hasn't been done to this extent before. We don't know the success that this project's gonna get. So it's a research project, but we do have to make it into a useful, usable product for our client to actually get and gain useful insights out of. So that's been a challenge, uh, and we're still working, but uh, we're, we're changing our research focus and blending that with good engineering, software engineering practices. Um, handling the interpretation biases that are in the data set itself. And there's no silver bullet for that. That is just, hey, this is what we're seeing in the data. And going back to the domain experts and they questioning it themselves and then them asking more questions of the data that we can then go show more. And then we go back and clean up the interpretation biases. And that's very similar in incorporating their domain knowledge. We can't just blindly throw this set of rocks at a, a convolutional neural network and expect it to give anything meaningful. We actually have to encode this in a, sense, in a way that makes sense geologically. Uh, and then the other ones. Managing the AI hype is one of my favorites. But. So, and there's, again, no silver bullet. That's just continual, like, education. Just continually getting the client up to speed on what is actually feasible and what is exciting as well, which parts are exciting. So, um, so that's the project. We're, we're looking into some pretty cool next steps. So we have a model, we have a functional pipeline that's able to automatically predict at any place across the mine. At every point, we can make a prediction. But we want to see where it's performing the best and then ask why is it performing the best there? And then we want to go further into the black. So we're really good when there's a lot of information, but in the less dense sense, uh, it's, it's not performing as well. How far can we push this current formulation of the problem? How far can we actually reach out and gain, get actual useful predictions? And then some of the solutions for that, right now we're just using those cubic, cube structures, uh, but mineral geology is elongated. Uh, so we're looking into actually learning on elongated uh, shape. And then also to speed up the training of uh, a CNN, we're looking into a, a pretty recent uh, research into sparse convolutional neural networks, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. So. Uh, and that's it for me. Yeah, so if you're not, how do I say it? not smart about how you prepare the data. Each training example is 2.4 gigabytes, and we have almost a million training examples. So this can get really, really big. Um, so we are pretty aggressive about our dimensionality reduction, and we can get, the, our, our current data sets are about 16 gigabytes. 
on disk, but then you have to desparsify it when you're actually convolving them, and then they grow again to uh, a couple hundred megabytes. Um, what was the second question? How long, it takes about two days to train on four GPUs. Uh, Oh, uh, like phase one? Yeah. I don't know. Nine months? How long? Yeah, um, it, yeah it, it actually took like uh, six to nine months. And there have been a lot of reasons for that. Like, I mean, you know, uh, it's okay to say, oh, I have structured data, but how do you even like get it into a flexible like, data model that will be scalable across, not just for this specific client, but we're trying to like build a platform that scales. Right. And uh, you have, uh, for example, you, I mean, talking about, uh, apart from the I mean, structure, we have geological model that you need to like, ingest into a database. There are different ways you can look at like, representing it, but looking at a smarter way to like, uh, represent it in your database, or uh, whatever like, 3D uh, I mean, platform you're going to ingest it to, uh, is not uh, really trivial. Yeah, so it took like six to nine months to do that. Oh, yeah, um, okay, yeah, I think I, I talked about it I mean, initially. Um, part of what we did as uh, our phase one was to say, okay, we're going to first build our own uh, optimization algorithm. And why? Because we're trying to like um, find intersection and distances between structures because that is how they can narrow down where the minerals are, the concentration of the minerals they're looking for. If you take, like, like I said, a drill hole, uh, maybe like 100, I mean, and 20 feet, for example, and you're trying to find the intersection to another shape object, say your oil, your gold, or whatever, I mean, you're trying to find, it takes every point today. If you look at, I mean, your uh, GIS, I mean, uh, post, uh, for example, your post-GIS 3D platform, it takes every point in the geometry and try to find intersection or calculate distance. So what we did initially was to say, we're going to build like a wrap around this, Build, uh, say, uh, some I mean, sort of object around each section and narrow down your intersection query. And that still didn't scale. Because you run some queries and it will never, I mean, uh, conclude uh, running. And that was why we came up with the GPU acceleration. And again, that's pretty unique. It's, uh, I, mean, I mean, first time uh, this has been done. And what we did is, uh, apart from uh, automatically detecting like, your geometric part of the query, and sending it to like I mean cluster of GPUs, we have to like develop a custom uh, algorithm that will run on the GPU. And instead of looking at each uh, point of your geometry, it's going to take a projection of say your drill hole and look at the face of a tetrahedron, and just look at the intersection of your drill to that face of the tetrahedron instead of looking at every point on your drill hole and every point in the shape object. And uh, actually, for some of the tests, it's like about 3,200 uh, times faster than uh, just, I mean, the initial optimization we did without the uh, GPU-specific uh, algorithm. Yeah, so the ones we're running today are 30 by 30 by 30, and then if you're not smart about how you encode the geo variables, it's the feature vector is 600, 6 to 700. So at four megabytes per, you know, geo variable, it, it grows really, really fast. Yeah, yeah, because they're flows. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So our technical evaluation is the uh, ROC curve, uh, and that one's very flexible to that uh, balance between true negatives and, uh, or yeah, tr uh, true positives and false negatives. Uh, and so that we can vary, they, they have a limit, they have, we've, they provided us a ratio of finding a, a gold hole is seven times better than, you can, you can find seven waste holes before Finding a gold hole, that's a success, right? And that technical evaluation metric is really good at, at that boundary can change and we can reevaluate how successful the model is right, within that new value. Very good question, though. Big part of the, the project. Uh, yeah. Sorry, a little louder. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 
sorry, the, the, the feedback loop on we train a model or um, a subset of models, and then we review the results and the predictions with the, the client, and then the client, look like vi we visualize them in 3D space, and we go, hey, we're very successful in this type of mineralization style, or we're really successful at this density of data. How can, how can we learn from that uh, to make it better in areas that were less successful? And so that weekly feedback loop, we're finding things like, hey, it's highly biasing to this type of lithology, but that lithology is actually just background noise. So maybe our results. That's examples like that. But without that, I'm, so I'm not a geologist in, in any way. Uh, without that, I don't know how you would do this project. You, you have to have that domain expert feedback loop. How do you rasterize the cube in 3D space? How do you decide? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so I just want to be careful about one thing, right? We are pushing the boundary of how much information we share. This is a live project. Um, obviously, we're complying on everything we're sharing here. But I want to make sure that I want to draw a line at some time. Right. And I hope you understand because uh, uh, there's a lot of IP here that we're generating. There's obviously follow-up conversation we can have, uh, both as a community. We're working with the University of Calgary uh, from an academic research point of view. But I kind of want to make sure I have this reminder for myself and everybody in the room here. that uh, helps you out here. All right, so we'll cut the questions there because we do have more speakers. Uh, so, but if you guys want to come find me and we can have a secret conversation over there without, <laughs> without Pavel. Like I said, one of the technical guys, I, I'm, it's hard to say no. Um, and yeah, if you want to applause when I walk away, feel free. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. I just want to add, like, I mean, finally, you can always like, you uh, come to his... I mean, either of us and some of our team members uh, that are part of the project. We have a lot of projects doing. And I just want to say, uh, every time I, uh, we have the opportunity to be in front of like wonderful communities like this, we're helping and supporting the growth of the community. And we are always we have amazing talent, but we are always like looking for other amazing talent. Just want to leave you with that. So feel free to like chat with me uh, or connect with me. Thank you.